Well, blessed day, St. Mark's friends and family. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Reverend Fran Cooper. So happy you've joined us for worship today. This is actually my last Sunday at this church. Our church is in a pastoral transition and in a couple of weeks, we'll welcome its new pastor, the Reverend Dr. Justin White. And I'm moving on to Larchmont United Methodist Church in Norfolk, Virginia. And so today you're going to hear a message that is a transitional message. It is my way of saying goodbye and hopefully preparing us for the next season ahead. We pray that you are experiencing God's Holy Spirit, whatever it is you're going through. We all go through transitional times and I pray that this message will help you to see where the Holy Spirit is leading you. God bless you. Well, it's my last Sunday with you, and I want to thank you, first of all, for that beautiful celebration we had last Sunday evening. It was such a blessing. I didn't really get a chance to speak, which means I can speak all I want today. <laughs> Let me just say everything, everything was perfect. In all my years of ministry, I can't remember a more perfect gifting as I farewell to you all. And uh, thank you for the speeches, for the weeping, for the laughing at my expense. <laughs> Thank you for all the amazing cards and the gifts that you have given to me. It, it's all very precious to me. And oh, the memories. The memories you picked were some that uh, were back there and I got to bring them up to the, my, my, uh, the front of my brain. And oh, that just made me so, so happy. I've had a few uh, memories that have come to mind that I would like to recall with you. One is, do y'all remember that very first St. Mark's has left the building day we shared? How glorious was that? Do you still remember what we say? St. Mark's has left the building. Let's go. Yes, and aren't you glad you're back now? <laughs> we enjoy going and we enjoy coming back. I'm remembering an NLI retreat day that we had in this very room. And do you remember when the district superintendent had us stand where we are and, and share what this church means to us. Oh my goodness, there wasn't a dry eye in this room as we heard the testimonies of our people. I'm remembering confirmations and our students leading us in worship together. I remember the one year we had 12 confirmands and they got to uh, be each of the 12 disciples. Do you remember them sitting up here like the 12 disciples around that last supper? and they led us in worship that day. We've had 312 Sabbaths together with sermons and music and fellowship and baptisms and communion, fellowship, food, <laughs> not to mention countless precious funerals and weddings and conversations among each other that have thread all of this together into a beautiful package of memory for me. Thank you for that. These six years, I will tell you, have grown me as a pastor, and for that I am thankful to you. Our years together have forced me at this particular point in my ministry to constantly remember what matters most. And here are the three things that I think y'all have helped me with. You've helped me to lift high the name of Jesus, You've helped me to remember that Christ's message needs to be proclaimed and shared in whatever way we possibly can. And you've helped me to remember how very powerful a united body of Christ sharing love can be. These are the things that we all need to have. So if I'm honest, I have to admit there have been a few grueling times, and I want to also share that those times have helped to sanctify me. And I thank you for those as well, because I know that God needed me to have that kind of sanctification. Thank you for bearing with me through it all. Do you need me to change microphones, Steve? Yeah. Awesome. I shall do that. As I was thinking about this pandemic, I, I had a memory come to mind that I hope that uh, some of you will remember this. Do you remember when we first 
were going through that, uh, those months, and we couldn't have communion together. And we said, no, we're going to have car communion. Do you remember those days? Do you remember how we wrote protocols and, and made purchases? We got gloves and masks and sanitizers and rolling carts, all kinds of things. Um, I think there's a video of, of what this looked like, um, and maybe y'all can show that as I continue to talk. Um, we all were faithful. You were creative. Look how brilliant you are. You devised ways to, to put carts together, to do the rolling car station radio thing. You figured out how to register people. You brought special communion baggies. You set up a tent. There was a keyboard there. There were musicians to play. You thought of all the safe things so that we could do these things together as a body of Christ. Isn't that awesome? Aren't y'all great? You can stop it now. Thank you. So much wonderful planning. What you didn't see before this video was what happened before. The major thunderstorms that came through that evening after they had it all set up tents, car radio, instruments. They drug all that sound equipment back inside along with the communion supplies and the instruments back inside the doorway and it was wet. All that electronic stuff, wet. <laughs> and then when that thunderstorm passed, we went back out again. And then what happened next? We had another thunderstorm. And they drug it all back in again. And, and they were trying to be very careful with the electronics. And, and when that one passed, we, um, we took it all back out again. And, and the car people still sat out there. They were like, we're getting our communion, <laughs> right? And so they stayed out there. They waited with us. They were patient with us. And we were ready to get our communion. And about last go up before I started my uh, devotion, a huge thunderbolt and, and lightning strike was about I, maybe 50 feet away. I don't remember. And we all jumped and the God bless the, the security people. They were very close by. Finally, it stopped. And we had our devotion. We had communion. We had those rolling carts. What you don't see is what happened after this. Because as they were rolling those carts around, gradually, a wheel came off. And then another wheel came off. And then another wheel came off. And I look over, and Jane and Janet are now carrying their cart on either side. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, how did that happen? Then I look on this side, and the other cart, they're doing the same thing. They're carrying the cart. You know, everyone has a good plan till the wheels fall off. <laughs> but we just kept on going. And at the end of that service, we picked up bolts and things that we tried to find in the parking lot so we could put it back together again. You can't get a, a good church down, can you? Y'all just kept on, kept on going. And we have such a great memory of that. We all just turned to each other and went, not today, Satan. And we kept on going. The message today is called, The Holy Spirit Promise Gets Passed On. This is my pivot week at St. Mark's. It's St. Mark's Pivot Week. It's my last Sunday to preach. Next Sunday, Rebecca Harmon will be preaching a transitional message. And then the following Sunday, Reverend Dr. Justin White will be your preacher. God's faithful people throughout the ages have done this kind of transitioning. And we get through it and we grow through it. We are better for it. And the reason why we're better for it is because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God we trust in these days. So I found an article on pastoral succession online, and the writer said this, the question of succession of leadership is important if the impact of any given institution is to outlive, say outlive, the limited, say limited, years of administration of a particular, say particular, of a particular leader. 
The writer shared how there are all kinds of different transitions or successive uh, leadership. He talked about the presidential succession. He talked about CEOs and staff members and companies. And he talked about pastoral leadership. Each denomination does it differently. We in the United Methodist Church call it itinerancy. And what he said is that in any and all of these contexts, the actual event of succession can be triumphant or disastrous or anything in between. And if he goes on to say, if we've spent any time at churches, we can think of examples of all of them. And so our Old Testament lesson today gives us an amazing example of succession. It was actually a triumphant example between two prophets, a man named Elijah and a man named Elisha. Their story is told in 1 Kings 17 through 2 Kings 13. And so if you ever want to look it up, that's where you can find it. I'm running all over the place, Scott. You just have to keep, keep walking with me, okay, today. I'm actually going to move this over here so I have my other hand available. So listen to the story about Elijah. Elijah was a prophet during a pretty tumultuous time of God's people. They had idol worship. They were being led astray by false prophets. And God's people were challenged and strengthened. And they were supported by Elijah's leadership. But he was very human. And he got older. And he got tireder. And he needed to get on with what was next. And so along came Elisha. And he was to be Elijah's replacement. God had a plan. And this is what he told Elijah. He said to him to anoint Elisha. Anointing is where you put oil on someone's head to set him apart for a particular purpose. Anoint Elisha. He knew where to find him. He was the son of Shaphat. From the town of Abel, Mahola, and he was to replace Elijah as the prophet. You see, this new guy, Elisha, had been a farmer. He'd actually been plowing a team of oxen, which turns out to be a really, really good first occupation if you're going to have a people to lead after, right? So Elisha would use his gifts to plow the field to plant the word among God's people. It was all in place. Elijah's time was finishing. Elisha's time was coming. And listen to what it says about this pivotal succession. In 2 Kings chapter 2. When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me. What can I do for you before I'm taken away? And Elisha replied, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit to become your successor. Elijah said, well, you've asked for a difficult thing. If you see me when I'm taken from you, then you will get your request. But if not, you won't. And as they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared. It was drawn by horses of fire. It drove between the two men, separating them. And Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioteers of Israel. And as they disappeared from sight, Elisha tore off his clothes. Elisha then picked up Elijah's mantle, which had fallen when he was taken up. Then Elisha turned back to the Jordan River, and he struck the water with Elijah's cloak and cried out, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And then the river divided, and Elisha went across. Isn't that a great scripture? I just love that passage about succession. And so as we look at Elijah and Elisha today, I have a few things I think we can learn from this passage about succession. The first thing we can learn is that succession is something that God both initiates 
and announces, and I'm going to say anoints. You heard about the anointing there. Now, most of you know that I'm heading eastward in Virginia because I do need to get closer to my 88-year-old mother. And frankly, as I get closer to my retirement years, it's good to kind of head back homeward. Some of you know what that's like as you head into your retirement years. I could have stayed here longer, but I can tell you the Holy Spirit made it very clear to both Bob and me, and it's really been confirmed by the leaders of St. Mark's that it's a really good time for a pastoral change. So I go with a very full heart and with deep pride for all that we have been able to do together. Bob and I are both going to churches that we know have been divinely set aside to use our gifts and our graces. And Reverend Justin White is coming here, and I know he has just the right gifts for the next chapter of St. Mark's Church. God's Spirit initiated it. God's Spirit announced it. And I will tell you, God's Spirit anoints it. I believe this with my whole heart. The second thing I think we can learn from this passage is in verse 13. It says, Elisha picked up Elijah's mantle or cloak, which had fallen when he was taken up into those chariots. Now, we got two servants, one mantle, and both Elijah and Elisha share the same mantle. I think it's a pretty beautiful image, isn't it? that Elisha inherits the power of God that was previously lived out in Elijah. The spirit of Elijah now rests on Elisha. When they saw Elisha, that's what the people said in verse 15, Elijah's spirit rests now on Elisha. What, a, what an amazing thing, and even a double portion, right? Because he saw that chariot as he was promised. And this mantle, is, it, it's a cloak that prophets would wear. And, and so the cloak fell, and Elisha picked it up. And, and I like to think of it like a mantle, sort of like the stoles that you've seen me wear over the years, right? One stole gets placed away, and the other one, and it gets picked up by the next pastor. Literally, it gets thrown off by Elijah. And then it says that Elisha has to tear his formal, former clothes. Now, I think that's a pretty interesting thing. He, he tears his former clothes before he picks up the mantle of Elijah. Now, I do not presume to be anywhere near the powerhouse that Elijah is. But I do know that I'm a human vessel, and I've worn the stole here for these six years, and I'll be followed by another human vessel who will, who will wear his stole, Pastor Justin. And this is important for us. I have to shed my old clothes. I have to shed my old responsibilities in order to pick up a new mantle where I'm going. That means I'm not your pastor anymore. That means Pastor Justin will be your pastor. He's the one you're going to call on for pastoral care and for teaching and funerals and weddings, for preaching, for scriptural insight, for sacraments, for leadership. And I will pick up my new mantle at Larchmont Church where I'm going. You see, Pastor Justin and I cannot serve two people at the same time. That's how God designed leadership to continue. And we all need to obey this plan. So here's another insight from this short passage. Though Elijah and Elisha share the same mantle of God's Holy Spirit, they are very different people. Now, they both are men, and they both are the same ethnicity. They have the same God. Those things are alike. But when you read on in 1 Kings and 2 Kings, you can see how very different these two leaders really are. The most obvious difference is their age. There, there is Elijah who is older, Elisha who's younger. But there's more differences when you look into the scripture. 
Elijah is evidently a kind of loner. In fact, Elijah is, is rather an introvert. In his time of leadership, he needed lots of recharging time between times with his people. He would literally go to a cave. <laughs> and then he would come out more energized, ready to serve them when they needed him the most. He had some pretty heavy lifting in those years. And that's how he did it. Now, Elisha seems to be more of an, ext an extrovert. He's a real people person. And so if you read on in 2 Kings, you read on about how, how that happens with him. They both see God very differently. And their backstories make their pastoral or prophetic stories unique. As we read on, we find out that Elijah has very few miracles, but they're epic. I mean, they would go on for, for chapters. Elisha had more miracles, but they were in smaller segments. And so this, my last Sunday with you, I would implore you to get to know Pastor Justin as he is. Take his family as they uniquely are. Justin has been a friend of mine for years. He's a good leader, and he loves God's people. He will love you all. And I invite you to see him for his personality. He's not a David one, a David two, a David three, or a Fran. And I know these personality differences can be very hard for church people. Paul addressed that very thing in that Corinthian passage that you heard Neil read, read earlier, right? Divisions even, even because of personality types. Has Christ been divided in factions, he asked? I belong to Paul. I belong to Apollos. I belong to Peter. He goes on to say, has, has Christ been divided into personality cults? The main thing he wants us all to know is to be of one mind. And you'll have this great, great mission statement here to grow, live, and love as followers of Christ. Keep that before you folks. Be of one mind and united in thought and purpose. That's what Paul tells his church. And I know comparisons are human nature, but please try, if you can, not to dwell on them. There is a writer who talks about the book of Kings and about the two prophets. And this is what he says, despite their differences, the commonality comes for Elijah and Elisha in the strength and the integrity of their respective witness. He says this, that Elijah and Elisha had these things in common, the heart and soul of prophecy, the uncompromising championship of the word of God. In Elijah and Elisha, you see that Israel knew that there was a prophet in Israel and that there was a God in Israel. You will know this in Midlothian. And I pray that this can be said about all the pastors who serve here at St. Mark's Church. So friends, today, whether this pastoral transition is hard or easy or somewhere in between for you, as God's people... You also need to shed your clothing from the past. You need to put on a new garment for a new day. Remember me well if you can, but more importantly, love your new pastor. Love his wife. Love his children. They are gifts of God for you, the people of God. And I pray that as you come into church on July 4th, you will come with this attitude. This is the day the Lord has made. Join me. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Brothers and sisters, I have been privileged to be your pastor these six years. And I really, truly am very proud of the ministry we've done together. Your guiding council chair, Ann Boyle, told me the other day as I was looking at her, as we were talking in this hallway, she said, Fran, we're going to make you proud. And I know, and I know you will. 
Moreover, I know you're going to make God proud. And I cannot wait to hear in Norfolk all of the amazing things happening at St. Mark's Church. Friends, I love you. I will miss you. I will pray for you. I offer this to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are. I worship you. 